Hello, you're very welcome to the AWARE webinar, The Role of Medication in Mental Health. And I'm delighted to welcome Eta Fitzgerald, Senior Pharmacist. We're just going to wait for, some, for a few moments for people to come in, and then we'll kick off. almost there just to welcome everybody So we'll get started. You're very welcome to AWARE's webinar, The Role of Medication and Mental Health. And I'm delighted to welcome Ita Fitzgerald, Senior Pharmacist in Mental Health. And Ita has very kindly offered and volunteered to talk to us about her experiences in working with people and supporting them around medication. And Ita has done a lot of preparation for this. We asked quest for questions in advance, and we did that because we wanted to get it right. We wanted to tailor this to what you, the people who've signed up for this webinar, would like to hear Ita speak about. The disadvantage of that for some of you is that you might not have the opportunity, you won't have the opportunity to ask your own questions. We won't have it open for Q&A at the end of this webinar. We hope that's okay and that you'll appreciate why we did it and that Ita will address your questions anyway that other people will have asked them if not we encourage you then to discuss whatever questions you have from this with your own gp psychiatrist medical professional or pharmacist so my name is claire hayes i'm clinical director with aware and just for those of you who might not be familiar with aware we support people who have depression and bipolar disorder and we have a number of resources and we also, they're on our website. I'm just double checking to make sure I'm covering everything I'm supposed to do. So we, and I would encourage you to do them. And we also have resources for people who care about people who have depression and bipolar disorder. So the way this webinar is going to go is Ita is going to do a presentation and then I will be in conversation with her afterwards. So I, without whatever the phrase is, further ado, I'd very much like to welcome Ita to introduce herself to you and to thank you in advance, Ita, for what I know is really important. My pleasure. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ita and I am a mental health pharmacist, as um, Claire covered. So I think we've kind of ad adequately covered the layout of today's webinar insofar as kind of what we can do with the time that we have. And thank you so much, everyone who did submit their questions. We tried to address kind of topics as broadly as we can, but I, I read as many as I could and they're all um, very important. So thank you for sending those to me. Just before we get started into um, the topics that we're gonna cover, there were a couple of things just that I wanted um, to mention just so that we know kind of what we are doing and what we're not doing. So in terms of um, conflicts of interest, so I don't actually have any, so I'm not here on behalf of any organization or company or anything like that I'm literally just here as a, as a standalone pharmacist in a voluntary capacity and um, so that's just important I think to clarify at the start in terms of our thinking behind the purpose of doing this I suppose it's something that comes up a lot from my own experience with dealing with people from lots of backgrounds is the role of medication across the spectrum of mental illnesses, whether that's potential benefits or indeed potential harms, is not really spoken about perhaps as much as it, it should be or as much as it could be. 
that's for many reasons, but I think a lot of the time it can lead to people perhaps unnecessarily being on medications which aren't necessarily beneficial, or perhaps not having access to medication that could really be helpful for you in terms of management of your mental health. So there's a lot of misinformation and I can see that in some of the questions that people sent and just from kind of talking uh, to the public previously. So my hope is that we can um, clarify some of those today and um, through answering your questions. The second piece is, just in terms of goals. I suppose what, what I want people to get from this not only is for information, but also that people would hopefully feel um, a little bit more empowered, if that's the right phrase, to engage in kind of shared decision-making around their medications for their mental health and to feel supported or to feel that they can advocate for themselves to do that. So we'll go through that in terms of questions. So we will cover like general knowledge as much as possible, but also um, we're gonna highlight some resources that might be helpful for people to have a look at themselves and really to inform discussions afterwards, whether that be with GP, psychiatrists, or hopefully pharmacists as well. So that's pretty much the agenda covered. Um, this is the first poll that I want to look at. Now, I don't know if this is working, and um, if it doesn't pop up as a poll, oh, it does. So essentially what I'd like people to do, so this is really useful for me in terms of highlighting resources if I know who the people are who are attending. So I'll pause for 30 seconds or so just actually to allow people to fill it in. So, um, for example, if you have access to a psychiatrist or if you are receiving healthcare uh, through a psychiatrist, actually that person might have access to a pharmacist. So I will pause just for a second to, to let people to fill that in. The answers will pop up once 30 seconds has elapsed, so I'll hang on until that. So, <laughs> mixture of the above or other. Okay, I'm just going to jot these down for a second, just so I know as I go through it. Okay, that is perfect. Um, thank you very much for that. That would be useful in terms of flagging resources as we go. Oh, I need to let me... Oh, there we are. Okay. So let's get started. So this um, slide is a little bit complex, but you don't really need to take too, too much from it. What it outlines is all the factors that go into a decision to prescribe a medicine and for a service user to take a medicine. So really what I wanted to outline here is just how complex it is. So these are kind of the three pillars of what, what we refer to as evidence-based medicine. And essentially, whether you're working in physical health or mental health, this is really what we as clinicians um, should be aiming for. So if we look, and again, I'm just gonna spend a minute on this in terms of um, best available evidence here in the left-hand corner, emphasis on the word available, and we will touch on that kind of going through it because often actually our research doesn't necessarily answer all the questions that we have as healthcare professionals or as members of the public. Um, so often we obviously use um, our available evidence that we have, but that has to be combined with clinician experience as well, especially if we don't have necessary answers and also very importantly patient values and preferences. So if I am a person who's going to consider taking an antidepressant and if I as a pharmacist say to you, um, this antidepressant for the management of unipolar, so not bipolar depression, gives you a one in three um, likelihood of reducing your symptoms to about 50%, we'll say, but that comes with a 20% risk of weight gain. For you, you might decide that's absolutely unacceptable for me. I'm not willing to do that. I'm, I really don't want weight gain, etc. Whereas other people might say, you know what, that doesn't bother me. I feel like I would be able to manage it if it did happen. And my symptoms are so severe or they affect my quality of life so much that I'm willing to accept that risk. So really what I'm trying to convey with this is two points. The first is that unless I had access to all the information that's available on this slide, I wouldn't be able to answer any question that is specific to an individual person's medication. It also means for you as a member of the public is that I might say, Claire, I've had a really good experience on lithium in the management of bipolar, whereas someone else actually might say, well, do you know what? Um, 
I'd like to try that. Let me talk to my GP about that. And that part is really, really important in terms of having that medication or having that information but also it means that we can't compare like with like because people are so different so it means that we need to be careful about the conversations that we have and who we have them with and um, as we're going through that just in that yellow box actually is all the things that we consider in terms of a pharmacist in and around medication handling so we need to consider a person's physical health comorbidities and their renal function their liver function etc so really it, it just highlights the complexity in this but we will go through kind of some general guidelines in and around medication choice so we're going to start with um, this topic around the initiation of antidepressants. So I'm mostly going to cover unipolar uh, depression initially, although I will kind of go through um, bipolar illnesses as well. Anxiety is kind of covered under the unipolar depression because the way we manage it now can be specific to the anxiety disorder, but it's pretty similar. So in and around the range of questions that we got is when I should start a medicine, should I do it before, alongside, after psychotherapy, will it interfere with how um, effective a psychological therapy is, if I do start it, how long do I need to be on it for, is going to be forever. If I do make the informed, hopefully, decision to stop it, how should I go about doing that to keep me safe and also to reduce your risk of symptoms coming back, so staying well. This comes up a lot in and around, can I become immune to a medication? And it's whilst it actually is a thing, it's not necessarily immunity to the medication. And we'll cover that in a little bit more detail in the next couple of slides. The last as well is something that comes up a lot. And this is where we go back to misinformation in and around fears of addiction or dependence on mental health medicine. So I actually have a little piece on that at the end because I wanted to cover um, sleeping tablets as well. So I'm, I'm gonna cover it with that just to be more efficient. So this is our second poll. And really this is kind of just to gauge where we're at again in terms of the information that I need to give. So um, this is a person, and I want people to answer this just from kind of what you think. You don't need to give it to you too much thought, but um, we'll have a, little, have a quick look at the background as well. So if I'm a person with unipolar depression, and again, the guidelines differ um, for bipolar versus unipolar, or I have an anxiety disorder, or indeed a coexisting anxiety disorder, and I have responded well to an antidepressant. And we talk about actually what um, responding well or what a meaningful response to a medication is a little bit later but let's say you've gotten what you want from that medicine how long should I stay on it for and again we'll just hold this up for um, 30 seconds or so so how long should I stay on that medication Okay, so 7% think four weeks, 30% think six months, 27% think 12 months, 24% think lifelong, interesting, and 12% think five years. Okay, so to a certain extent, that was a little bit of a trick question, only because we don't have enough information in this particular question to answer that. So obviously this is a very important part in terms of using medication and it's something that we need to be better as healthcare professionals about giving information when anyone starts on a medication. So I was kind of thinking about how best to display all the complexities in relation to medication choice across the spectrum of mental illnesses without waffling. So I thought, now see will this let me move it. I thought I would use a case study as an example because I think it's often easier to learn that way as well. So let's look at Joe. So Joe um, presents to his GP with a moderate depressive episode. I'm not gonna go into diagnosis because that's not my area of specialties, but it's important to note that diagnosis. So Joe is obviously a 35 year old male and he has no history of depression. So let's hold here for example, or for a second. So there's two factors that we need to take into account here. So this is Joe's first presentation. And that's really important because our response to antidepressants from our research evidence shows that unfortunately, that that response decreases with time. So if I'm a person that presents with my first episode of depression compared to someone who presents with four, five, six upwards, 
the types of medications that you might use and the length of time that you would be on it for are very different. And we'll, we'll look at a more kind of chronic case after this. But note also that this person, again, is unipolar. So bipolar tends to be a more chronic illness for lots of people. So you might be on a medication um, for much longer in that case. So also note the moderate depressive episode. I've highlighted it in black for a couple of reasons. So according to kind of general guidelines, and this would be from the research evidence, obviously, whenever we make a choice to take any medicine, again, as I, as I said, whether it's physical health or mental health, there's a trade-off between the risks and the benefits. Mostly the risks look like side effects or, or whether there's any kind of risks to our mental health, some, sometimes people feel, or physical health as well, which we will address if we're on them longer term. So for someone who has a moderate episode of depression, a lot of the time the risks and the benefits need to be considered in detail. And often that's because in those who kind of have milder illnesses or more moderate presentations, and there's ways that GPs can kind of uh, define that according to the number, um, or indeed psychiatrists, the number and types of symptoms that, that you present with. So the risks and the benefits are different in a moderate or mild depressive episode. So often in those cases, now it's different when it starts to progress from moderate to severe, but in kind of mild or mild to moderate illnesses, often actually the risks of taking medications, which really are side effects, outweigh the benefits. So often in those people, what we will do is explore psychotherapy more as an option. Indeed, if that's something that you feel that you can do, that you're able to do and that you would like to do, and unfortunately, I do know resources can be an issue sometimes, but that's kind of where we sit in terms of medication here for this specific person. If it were um, a severe presentation of uh, depression or if the person had multiple histories of depression, especially if they had previous severe episodes, we would consider an antidepressant earlier. So it is complex in terms of when we decide to start it. So it's indeed it's not a one size fits all model. Um, but I hope that gives a kind of general understanding of the initial choice. Some people have asked whether or not um, psychotherapy can interfere with a or, pharmacological therapy across the board really can interfere with a person's ability to engage in psychotherapy. So most of the time medicines do not cause emotional blunting. I know sometimes they can and if that does happen that's obviously a really unpleasant thing. We don't accept that as a given and indeed there are other choices where that wouldn't happen but actually a lot of the time people actually feel that medication helps them to get to a certain level to engage in other things that are helpful for their mental health whether that be psychological support, social supports etc. So so it's one tool in your toolbox, but it's not the only tool. And it shouldn't be such in the majority of cases that it interferes with you doing other things which are helpful for you. So for this person, Joe, we start on sertraline 50, which is a very common SSRI. So it increases serotonin levels only. And that's increased every two weeks till 100 milligrams. So that's a reasonable enough dose. And um, there is a lag time in response to antidepressants. So I've highlighted this here because we do need to be cognizant that it can take about six weeks um, with mental health medicines to get a response. So it's important that we don't jump ship straight away. Now, if you're experiencing side effects which are distressing or which interfere with your quality of life, that's different, hence in Joe's case. So Joe, unfortunately, develops a very common um, side effect of sexual dysfunction. And we're going to talk about that in detail a little bit later because it's a common question that always comes up. So what do we do in this case? Do we wait or do we switch to something else? So if someone again had had if that was a side effect which for most people it will be that interferes with their quality of life and it's not a side effect that tends to wear off with time which sexual dysfunction isn't so in the majority of cases where that happens we do switch to a different antidepressant so um in this case we switch to duloxetine which is an snri so it means it works or it increases serotonin and noradrenaline in the brain uh, so we cross titrate which means we drop one down slowly while bringing the other one up um, slowly. So he is put on 60 milligrams of duloxetine and at the same time he begins ACT therapy. So this is acceptance and commitment therapy. I know very little about it. I just put it in really to highlight that there are other therapies apart from CBT. Um, but Claire obviously would know a lot more about that than I would. Um, but I just want to, to throw it in. So Joe does get some nausea but thank God he um, doesn't have any more sexual dysfunction and he does achieve remission. So this is important when we think about response to medication. So if I am a person like Joan, I'm first presenting to my GP, it is very reasonable in that case, and it should be the goal of therapy that we're going for remission of symptoms. So that means symptoms are brought down to a very, very low level or they're not present at all. 
unfortunately, as I said, as time goes on and the more and more episodes that you have, and it brings in this kind of concept of immunity to medications, you are less likely to respond to those medicines and our goals of treatment might change. And often that can be, well, can I reduce my symptoms to a meaningful level actually that I can engage with other things that help me? Um, you know, does it reduce distressing thoughts that I have, etc. So whilst remission is always the goal and those people who actually, especially initially achieve or achieve remission compared to those who don't are less likely to relapse. So we do always go for that, but in unfortunately, and, and such is the nature of the beast. So people don't actually lose response to medication. A lot of the time, unfortunately, it is a more chronic underlying illness that's happening in the form of depression that's actually coming through. So it's really important to get frequent review in terms of optimizing medication medication choice but yes it can happen and often people think that it's actually the antidepressant whereas in most cases as long as you haven't added in another interacting medicine etc unfortunately it is the nature of the illness so I hope that's kind of demonstrated some of the complexity in terms of making medication choices in mental health and, and we'll look a little bit later around some resources that kind of put all that information together because it is a lot in one go. So often I, I use this analogy with people and I read it in a book before and I just found it was very helpful. So often people will say to me, and I saw it in some of the questions, you know, I had a very bad um, episode of depression. It was very severe for me. It really affected X, Y, and Z in my life. I took antidepressants, they saved my life. Now, when can I stop them? So I always say to people, it's like you, it's lashing rain outside and I put up my umbrella and think I'm off out now to stay dry. And so I'm really dry. So I think, right, I might as well put down my umbrella, but it's still lashing rain. So it's a little bit different in terms of depression because we don't have a biological marker that says your depression is now at a suitably low enough level so that you can stop taking medication. And this is again where this uncertainty comes into it that we have. And it's something that we as healthcare professionals in terms of risk and, and um, acknowledgement of that. Don't talk about a lot perhaps. And um, it's where the concept kind of of informed discussion and decision-making is really, really important to know actually, well, you know, if I am a person with several episodes of depression, what is the likelihood that I can stop taking a medication? So I hope I, I displayed that with some of the last um, or as part of the last case, but we'll look at a more chronic case as well now to look at actually, well, what's my likelihood of relapse? Can I stop medicines, etc.? So this is a much more chronic case. So this is Alice, she's a 28 year old female and she is taking venlafaxine XL225. So venlafaxine is very similar to geloxetine, but it's probably our most commonly prescribed antidepressant. So Alice is different to Joe. So she's had two previous episodes of depression. Importantly, she has good psychosocial support. So that's really important because whilst antidepressants are very effective medicines in terms of treating biological symptoms, if there is an underlying depression, they don't treat poor um, psychological circumstances or social circumstances, unfortunately. So sometimes people feel, well, my antidepressants have stopped working, but I'm still living in a household perhaps where it's not good for my mental health or I work in a job where I don't feel valued you know these are these are kind of universal things to everyone so that may be another factor that we need to consider in terms of Alice's previous response to medication as that will influence our ongoing choices she's had two SSRIs um, previously and today she presents with kind of core symptoms of depression like insomnia loss of appetite so what do we do in this case so uh, there were some questions that people said well you know do I go up in my medicine do I go down I'm chopping and changing around the houses uh, what's best for me. So this is where the concept of dose response comes into it. So there is some evidence for some antidepressants and it's not the evidence of, or the absence of evidence is the evidence of absence. We're just not too, too sure for some medications that higher doses are more effective than lower ones. And that's important because our higher doses are going to be associated more commonly with side effects. However, there is some evidence for venlafaxine, especially um, in more severe depression depressive episodes that it's more effective at higher doses. So in this case, we do increase with blood pressure monitoring because then the vaccine can increase your blood pressure at higher doses. So Alice has achieved some response to then vaccine, but has not achieved remission. In someone who's had two previous episodes, I still would be going for remission as a goal of treatment here. And if I didn't, I would be going back to ask, well, what else can I try to push my symptoms down? Um, in this case, actually, we added on, or theoretically, we added on a medication called mirtazapine. And I wanted to, to use this specifically here here is an example as the combination of venlafaxine and mirtazapine is super common um, in primary care. So 
and secondary hair. So mirtazamine works in a different way to venlafaxine, but both work to increase serotonin and noradrenaline. So the two working together, it's, it's a synergy or it's kind of like a two plus two equals four situation. So that can give people a better chance of getting well. The major drawback with mirtazamine, as with many of our mental health medicines, is weight gain. And that tends to be quite rapid and it can be quite significant. But we'll talk about weight gain a little bit later. So thankfully, in this case, Alice does achieve remission. So she should stay on her medication for at least two years. And this concept of staying on your medication, it's not as if I, I get well, and I stay on my medicine for two years. And then after two years, I, I go off the cliff in terms of symptoms again. So actually what that two year piece is, it's reducing your chances of relapsing when you do stop. So if I'm on a medicine, let's say for six months and I become well and all of a sudden I go, oh, I'm just gonna stop that now. That will significantly increase your chances of becoming unwell again, if you stop it quickly. And also if you haven't given yourself that kind of cover time. And again, if this was a person who had had kind of four or five upwards, um, periods of depression or indeed a more chronic illness like a bipolar illness it may be the case that in order for you to achieve what you wanted for medication that you may need to be on them longer term and again unfortunately such is the nature of the illness but it's it's when side effect management and actually engaging more with service users is really important so that the medication helps you not not hinders you and this leads us to the last slide that I'm going to cover because I know it took up a chunk of our time whereas I'll be much quicker on, on side effects but I wanted to leave it at this. So often we talk about side effects, et cetera, and, and what medicines can take from us, but I don't know if we're as explicit. And it's something I try to do a lot with um, service users in work is in relation to, well, what does medicine add to your life? And these need to be here as well. You know, that way it's, it's not just a thing of, well, I have this and I'm on this medication, but actually it doesn't really help me because then it's not adding any clinical benefit or meaningful benefit to your life. So. You know, we're not looking for the Boston Marathon a lot of the time. Is it that I can get up out of bed every day and go for a walk that I want to? Can I do volunteering? Or is it that actually, you know, I can get back to full functioning. I want to work full time, etc. So we need to be better at being more explicit in terms of what medicines add. And at each stage, when you have a review of your medicines, whether you plan to be on it for six months or five years, actually thinking about that at each time so you're weighing it up. So I will stop at this poll for, and again, another 30 seconds. So this is um, our introduction to side effects. So I know that side effects happen a lot. Um, and actually it's the distress caused by side effects that causes people to stop taking medicines. So I want to know what you guys think um, are the most distressing side effects caused by medications across the board. So we'll move on a little bit now to cover the spectrum of mental health medicines rather than just antidepressants. So these are the ones that I'm most common are most familiar with in terms of distress but it would be useful to know what you think so sedation weight gain uh, sexual dysfunction this fear of addiction or dependence if you do take them or sweating So 45% think weight gain, which is always top of the poll. Uh, sedation, 22%, again, very important side effect. Sexual dysfunction, 12%. Addiction and dependence, 17. How interesting. Okay, well, I'm glad. And then sweating, five. So actually we're covering most things apart from, from sweating, unfortunately. Um, so that's useful in that sense. But again, I'll show you some resources on, on sweating management as well. So let's talk about weight gain. Um, I spend a lot of my job talking about weight gain and it doesn't bother me, but it's more so just, I suppose, to highlight how much of a prevalent side effect it is across our um, medicines as a category. So I've highlighted the ones in black here, which tend to be the worst in terms of no matter what cohort you're looking at, no matter how long you're looking at in terms of outcomes, these tend to be the most clinically significant in terms of the actual amount of weight gained. So yes, mood stabilizers like lithium and valparate can cause weight gain, doesn't tend to be as unruly as the likes of our antipsychotics, which are always top of the pole. So um, alanzapine inevitably 
is always going to be the worst in terms of weight gain. Clozapine is an antipsychotic used in treatment resistant um, schizophrenia. So I've just included it there in case anyone is here who's, who's taking it. Lower risk tend to be quetiapine, risperidone, palperidone, um, and then the lowest risk are aripiprazole and um, amisulpride. In terms of antidepressants, I've already highlighted mirtazapine um, and trazodone as well. And we're going to look at some management mechanisms as well now, depending on the medication that you're on. It is, however, important to note this. The mechanism behind that weight gain is an increase in appetite. So some people sometimes feel like, God, you know, I was on a junct of olanzapine for the management of generalized anxiety disorder and um, I've stopped taking it, will it slow down my metabolism? There is no evidence that it interferes with your metabolism. And most people will actually say, especially those on antipsychotics and particularly lanzapine, that they're absolutely starving all the time. So it can interfere, or our medicines in general can interfere with um, people's hunger hormones and, and regulating their appetite. So that's the kind of mechanism behind that. And often people tend to crave like high energy foods, carbohydrates, things like that. So in terms of the questions we always get asked, so Will I gain weight? How much will I gain? When does it stop? Can I still lose weight whilst on medications and how should it be managed? So I've listed some management options here and these aren't in order. Whilst some guidelines do list a hierarchy, I'm not really in favour of sticking to that approach because I feel like there isn't evidence to support that and it's not um, in order to make meaningful reductions in weight. I think we need to be more individualised in our approach. Really, really important to note here because it's different to many of our side effects. It is not dose dependent. So if I'm on 2.5 milligrams alongside my antidepressants for anxiety management, or if I'm on 20 milligrams for the management of schizophrenia, the differences in weight outcome, and we have a lot of data on this because it is such a common side effect, are not there. So if you are on a lanzapine 2.5 for helping with sleep, for example, you really need to think, well, is it actually there? Is it creating a meaningful clinical benefit to justify me putting on weight and sometimes people reduce weight as a management mechanism it's not effective um, and shouldn't be done this time to plateau comes up a lot because obviously that's a really important question well when when it's when will it stop and the answer is we don't know and in some people it can be years so management there especially if you find that that antipsychotic is really really helpful for you especially in mania and things like that and bipolar um, you need to make sure that it's actually helping because it can be a long-term medication. You can switch it in some cases. Now, it's beyond the scope of this, but sometimes um, in bipolar and in schizophrenia, which I know schizophrenia is outside the, the topic kind of of this, but there can be minor efficacy differences between the antipsychotics, which can make a difference in more chronic cases, not so much, not so much earlier in your stage of, of illness. So that is important to discuss before you do have a switch, but those lower risk options can be very, very useful in terms Terms of managing it. Um, diet and lifestyle, so whether you can lose weight on medication, you can, but will it be more difficult? Yes, unfortunately, is my experience with it. In terms of what the most effective management styles are, we're looking at kind of HIT or high intensity training um, and strength-based training tends to be becoming more and more effective now in the evidence that we have. If you are on a lanzapine, you find it very helpful for schizophrenia or a family member is, et cetera, and you're worried about weight gain, there is a role for metformin in some people in terms of pharmacological management, because that actually, um, it is an anti-diabetic medication, so we use it off-label, but it's quite effective at curbing appetite. So often people find that having it can help them engage more in diet and lifestyle because they can curb their appetite and, and cut their portion size so it doesn't lower blood glucose levels unless they're raised at baseline so you can use it in the general population but it is a more kind of specialist use at this time but you can discuss that with a gp or a psychiatrist very easily as well so we're now just for two minutes look at sexual dysfunction so again this is super super common in both males and females it doesn't tend to be as distressing as we just saw in terms of weight gain but still really important so what medicines cause it does it go away and how should i manage it are the most common um questions that come up so in terms of what sexual dysfunction presents as it can look very differently so some people can have um, effects on sex drive actual arousal um, or ability to reach orgasm as well so it presents differently in different people it does tend to be a dose dependent side effect so it might be something that you can play around with in terms of dose reduction for uh, relief of symptoms it can wear off sometimes but more often than not it doesn't so as i said earlier we would be looking um for a switch i've highlighted this here because this is a new thing that I see in terms of um, medication safety alerts. So now there is some data from cohorts who are studied over longer periods that sometimes in some people, and we don't really know who those people are yet, when you withdraw those medications that that sexual dysfunction can be prolonged. 
in most people it's not in my experience but I, I just wanted to flag that because that's important we're learning more about it so who knows what will happen in the future but it, it's still important to highlight so how do you manage it most of the time if we can we'll switch um to what are typically considered lower risk options so um these are mirtazapine. Again, though it's coming with weight gain, you have to think about where you sit in relation to that. Bortioxetine actually is a, is a relatively, it's Brintilex as the brand name. It's a relatively new antidepressant, but can be very helpful with sexual dysfunction. Again, we don't have that much data. Well, we do to a certain extent, but not as much as the likes of venifaxine, sertraline, older antidepressants, but still um, is a useful option to consider. And indeed, geloxetine actually um, seems to be lower risk. So those are options you could discuss with. All kind of have relatively comparative efficacies in unipolar depression. And um, some would not be suitable in bipolar depression, but um, still a really, really useful option to consider if it's bothering you. So this is something as we begin to wrap up that I wanted to highlight in terms of um, choice in medication. So this is a website that's developed by psychiatric pharmacists in the UK, and it does a lot in terms of patient decision aids or information that's made available for the public, which isn't made or doesn't come from the manufacturer. So it doesn't tend to be too, too complex or open up like a map. So this is, uh, you can Google choice of medication, even though I've put it as a resource at the end. And essentially what it does is it provides a lot of these handy charts that helps you to compare the symptoms um, of depression and also actually the differences between between side effects. So let's say, for example, you were experiencing, let's use sexual problems, it does a kind of relative risk of those symptoms along or of those side effects along the side. So it actually allows you to bring something to the GP and say, look, this is bothering me. I see that bortioxetine is lower risk. Do you think that this might be something for me? And um, what might that me being on that look like? Well, what side effects does that have? And you can kind of see it from this. So often um, you can match a medication to what you think might be helpful um, for you. So this is one of the second last topics I wanted to cover in relation to this concept of will my um, symptoms get worse initially before they get better when I start on medications and um, can you get an increase in anxiety and sometimes this increase in suicidal thoughts as well. So yes you can get an increase in anxiety much 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 more commonly than suicidal thoughts so it's kind of this paradoxical increase and it can be worse in people who have um specific types of anxiety disorders especially panic disorders as well where you tend to be more sensitive to those kind of groups of side effects so a lot of the time we expect it so we go in with quite low doses and we build up slowly and um, especially if a person is concerned about that or, or has had previous side effects to medications where they felt like it increased their anxiety or else sometimes we use adjunctive um, medications to lower that and um, usually if it does happen it's kind of for two weeks after you start and after you increase the dose in relation to suicidal thoughts yes it can happen but it's a lot more uncommon than um anxiety for example so should that happen it's super super important to get in touch with a GP whoever it is that's looking after your care because for most people staying on that particular medication is not worth the risk um, for you so if you find that those thoughts happen or they get worse it would be um, prudent I suppose to, to contact um, your healthcare provider straight away more common in people who are younger and under the age of 25 so it's often why GPs will say I want to see you in two weeks and often actually um, will make people aware of that just so if that happens we can act quicker so that's the kind of piece around can they make you worse before they can get better so often we expect a little bit of increase in anxiety we can help you along with it but um, should suicidal thoughts happen we would often consider that not acceptable so the final piece is in and around this addiction or dependence piece. So our antidepressants, our antipsychotics, our mood stabilizers do not meet the criteria for either physical or psychological um, dependence. So we do not consider those to be addictive medicines in any way, shape or form. Within our class of medicines, sometimes we can use sleeping tablets or benzodiazepines. They are the only medications that you can actually get a physical withdrawal from should you stop um, taking them. When some people stop medications, particularly certain types, they can get what we call a discontinuation syndrome. So I almost describe it as it took a little bit of time for your body to get used to it. Now it will take a little bit of time for your body to get used to not having it. Most of the time, however, that looks like nausea, 
Sometimes people can get an increase in anxiety and um, pins and needles sometimes with venlafaxine. The most likely antidepressants to cause that are venlafaxine, which is effects are paroxetine, which is seroxet, but we don't really use too, too commonly, or things like MAOIs, which are monoamine oxidase inhibitors, but they're really old drugs, some tricyclics as well. So we would always say to stop it slowly. That significantly reduces the likelihood of that happening. So for most people with an antidepressant, you're looking at about four weeks. If you were stopping an antipsychotic and you were using it for, let's say, depression um, that presented with psychotic symptoms, we would do it very, very slowly. Or if you were um, withdrawing a mood stabilizer, you're looking at about three months um, or so in the management of bipolar. So the only medicines which can be addictive are benzodiazepines and Z drugs. And that's really important if you're thinking of not using a medication because of fear of addiction. Um, and it's important to be aware of that if someone does take sleeping tablets. So they tend to be Zulfidem or uh, Zopiclone, which is still not, or Zimazane, and then some of the benzodiazepines that we do use for anxiety, but you need to be using it for longer than six weeks and using it regularly. If you took a sleeping tablet one week and then you didn't take another one for three weeks, the likelihood of addiction there is so, so low. So it's continuous use that actually you do develop um, tolerance to the medication and dependence in some people. So this is the, the final slide before I just highlight resources. Some people, and again, this is a really busy slide, so you don't need to take much from it because I've, I've um, included links for these. So a lot of people, and again, it links back into the weight gain about our physical health monitoring for those that are on medications. It is absolutely so important and, at no stage do we want to sacrifice a person's physical health for their mental health. And from your side, actually responsibility about going to monitoring um, with your GP if you're in the community is really, really important. And it allows us to spot weight changes quickly. For example, it allows us to spot changes in blood glucose, for example, if you're on antipsychotics quickly. So lithium, um, often what we're looking at is, is kidney function, thyroid function, and your weight. Um, so lithium can affect people's kidney and thyroid function, much less commonly kidney function if you're on it for a long time. Valparate sometimes and again rarely can affect full blood cell count and liver. I just wanted to highlight contraceptives here for females. So Valparate is highly teratogenic. So um, if any females are on it, they need to be on contraceptives and they need to um, be really, really aware and have um, an in-depth consultation about the risks so you understand it. With the antipsychotics, as you can see, and again, this is no matter what you're using the antipsychotics for, there is a super big, massive range of monitoring. So I've included resources, but really it's about a full physical health check that you would get um, if you were just going to the doctor anyway. So you're often looking at glucose, lipids, your weight, etc. Um, all those. So I've included uh, some resources down there. The final thing is, if people are having side effects, it's really important to tell us. And the sooner you tell us, the sooner that we can do something meaningful about it. We don't want people to be on medications that they're not comfortable with. Sometimes, especially more chronic illnesses, it's not as straightforward. Perhaps there needs to be a little bit of give, but often there are things that we can do. And if you let us know, we can help. So that's just the uh, Choice in Medication website there um, at the end. So I've included it as a link, but as I say, if you Google Choice in Medication and kind of go through, um, either you can get conditions, so it, it, it tells you about ADHD, depression, all these sorts of things. And in the view leaflet section, there's handy leaflets, which give you those charts about the different antidepressants, which are really useful. There's the physical health um, monitoring to it. And I've also included just a resource on stopping benzodiazepines or Z drugs. So if anyone is on sleeping tablets, that's listening or benzodiazepines and would like to stop them. The HSC published some really useful patient information in 2017 along with a guideline um, for healthcare providers. So you can have a look at that link. It's really, really useful in terms of what to expect if you do want to stop them. And that's me. Hope I didn't take too, too long, Claire. Not at all. That was just absolutely fascinating, Isha. And the good part of this, uh, one of the good things is that this is going to be, it is being recorded so people can have access to it by an email link, but also it will be on the website because you've given so much information and I know you were under pressure to get as much as you possibly could in. So thank you. I'd love to come and come from the other end. And as I was listening to you, the song, Oh, the Cowboys and the Farmers Can Be Friends was whizzing around my head because I just had a sense of, oh, this is the world of pharmacists. And it was just fascinating to, to get an insight. And my experience of working with depression as a clinical psychologist is coming at it from a different angle. And just, I know from, and you know, from some of the questions and some of the comments we got prior to this, there are some people who are completely opposed to the idea of medication at all. And I know as well, there are people that really, the word illness 
in when people are describing depression can jar too. My understanding of depression is very much a biopsychosocial approach, and I know you've very much referred to that. So the medication is a biological, and then in terms of helping people understand and cope with depression and bipolar disorder, it's really important to look at the social piece of it and having the friends, being able to have one trusted person that they can talk to. And that's where they, the therapy can come in, very important as well. And then also the, so the psychological managing what's in their head and getting a balance in terms of our work, rest and play. So I really appreciate Lita, how you, you mentioned that. And also it's important for people to discuss with their health provider. And you mentioned that several times. So while you're giving information, it's certainly not our focus today in any way encouraging people to do anything in terms of the medication. And I know, I know you agree with that. So the, the biopsychosocial approach is helping people look at, you know, what are, what are they thinking? And if I can share with you maybe a little bit of my experience working with, when people ask me about medication, yeah. um, my immediate answer is always, I'm not a medical practitioner, I'm not a pharmacist, so it's really important to discuss that with them. And that's always been the party line in terms of aware as well. And we always refer people to it. But it's very important that we have a conversation because the, the medication is such an important part for people who need it. Mm -hmm. So when people ask me about it, I, I explain that it's important to, to discuss it with their, their medical person. But for me, it's not so much the medication, it's the meaning of it for them. So I've worked with some people over the years who have been really struggling. They've had low energy, they've had low mood, they've had all the experiences of depression that are really difficult. And it's, it's, there's no sense of enjoyment in life. And they don't have the energy to engage in the psychological aspects or the social. And what I found is that if they get the medication, it can give them a lift. Yeah. And they, so CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, or ACT acceptance commitment therapy, or any of the other kind of therapies that people find that they work can be really, really helpful. So both work very, very well together. And I always put if medication is needed. And my training was very much that medication can help people have a lift, but on its own, it's not enough because. If people are going for a walk and they're thinking, oh, I'm just useless, I'm, you know, I'm too heavy, everybody's looking at me, there's no point anyway, and they're not challenging or we're not challenging what we're thinking. And or if we're saying, oh, you know, I don't feel like it, I'll wait until I feel better, then it's not going to work. And, and my experience of any of us at any age is we can see medication as making us feel better. And I love how you in your presentation said, well, actually, that's not necessarily the case. Initially, with the anti-anxiety medication, people might feel worse. And when I'm encouraging people to what I call take their power back from anxiety, so to go out anyway, even if they don't want to, not to wait until they feel better, they might actually feel worse. So I think there's a, it's really important to bring those strands in together. And then looking at the other ap aspect, I've had people who've told me, oh my gosh, I'm on medication, I feel great and I don't ever, ever, ever want to come off it. And there is a fear that if they come off the medication, all the steps that they've taken in place in terms of increasing their social support, in terms of getting a different balance in their life, the work, the rest, the play, all of that is suddenly going to crumble. And they're putting all of the credit for them feeling better onto the medication. So it's really important for us, I think, to think of, well, what is the meaning of the medication? And then I've had the experience, and I'll, I'll hand back over to you in a second, Dita, but I've had the experience of working with people who've told me that they, they thought they were having, they were, there was something wrong with them. And then they were told, you are depressed. I would say you have depression, you're experiencing depression, and here, take this medication. And for them, it, the meaning for them was that they were a failure. So every time they took a tablet it reinforced for them that they were doing something wrong so i would encourage people in the whole area of medication to discuss the meaning and explore the meaning of it for them as well as what they're actually taking and the side effects i know i've said a lot there Rita. what what's your thoughts on that i have a couple of thoughts i think in relation to when you're talking about like not putting all your eggs in one basket i suppose you know it's 
it's the same for anything in terms of when you think about illnesses across the board. I think what you've highlighted is so important in relation to access to multidisciplinary teams. And it's something we don't have all the time in the community. Now, I know community mental health teams really are improving and there's more access. And, and I know people highlighted that actually they were using it in the poll at the start. But that's so important, like access to social work. Access, oh. I'll just stop my sharing that's okay it doesn't really matter um access to social work um around the work-life balance access to psychologists all those sorts of things occupational therapists i know even when i sit in multidisciplinary teams each week i learn so much even from being around other healthcare professionals as to how to come at it with a multi-pronged approach especially when we think about the biopsychosocial model and the role of medications for some people and, and as you said getting you part of the way but not necessarily getting you all of the way what i would say to people sometimes when it comes up around uh, fear of starting medications because perhaps you feel like you know that that you have failed or that there's something wrong with you because you know you have to take a medication or even if you like it so much that you don't want to, to stop it but other people are saying perhaps try do that you know what i always would say to people is it's really important to give people back their autonomy so i often say to them even if you're considering a medication at any time you can change your mind so you can decide this isn't for you so sometimes i think it's useful to do that in terms of saying this may help why not try it for a couple of weeks? See, does it get you any part of the way that you want to be? But at any time, if you're not comfortable, come back to me. We can look at something else. We can look at nothing for a while. We can look at other resources. So it's complex. And I think the the feeling of failure is, is very difficult. And it would, it would be something that I would struggle with even around having um, conversations with some, with some people. And perhaps a lot of it is around acceptance, you know, that sort of way, because I think that's really difficult for some people. And often I know that what I would say in, as well, in, in terms of sometimes people don't want to take medications because of, um, you know, community influences, family influences and all those sorts of things or this perception that it's a crutch or I shouldn't need to take medications. And often, you know, I say to people, it's like someone that lost their leg and needed a prosthetic calling it a crutch, you know, that sort of way, because it's not like in the reality, this is what's happening it's interfering with your ability to live your life to the fullest extent or for you to get what you want to get out of it. From my side, I'm like, if this could be a tool to help you, why don't we try? But like you said, it's important to come at it from multiple sides in order to give the person the best chance of staying well once they get well. And also being able to, I suppose, deal with the blips that are inevitably gonna come along for all of us, you know, you know that sort of way, because things are going to be difficult. And sometimes people say, well, if I'm on medication, then why did I get upset when someone was rude to me and or I perceived something like, you know, I had an argument or something bad happened, you know, that way. And I think there in terms of psychological therapies or even how you speak to yourself, all those sorts of things come in massively and, and indeed help all of us, not just those who, who do have an episode of, of a mental illness. So I think in terms of, yeah, giving you the best chance of getting well, it's the best approach. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Yeah, no, no, no. And it's, it's more it's more conversation as well, Ita. So it's, it's really interesting to hear your perspective on this and, and your expertise. And again, I'd really like to thank you for the amount of work that you've put in. And I know from having spoken to you in, in planning this, that there was there were so many questions and you wanted to cover every everything and, and that's just not possible so any questions that people have again if anyone missed the introduction we encourage people to to go to their GP their pharmacist their mental health provider and and ask them the questions and I think that's that's what's coming out for me with with from what you're saying the, the big thing is to really ask inform ourselves not just take something because we've been told to just find out about it sure. and then then the balance in terms of you know exploring the meaning and also AWARE has so many resources. So I'd encourage people to look at the website and it gives a very strong um, definition of what depression is. It's not just feeling down. It affects every aspect of life mm -hmm. in terms of our um, appetite and sleeping and mm -hmm. putting on weight and not wanting to do things and motivation and all of that. Also AWARE's resources. So I'd just like to highlight that AWARE have free resources that are there. They have cognitive behavioral therapy courses called life skills. There is face-to-face -face groups. Well, they're obviously on hold because of, Zoom, um, because of COVID, but they're on Zoom. They're called life skills. And they're also online life skills. 
the six sessions developed by Dr. Um, Chris Williams in the UK and the eight sessions developed by Dr. John Shari and his colleagues in Silvercloud and they're evidence-based and they're really, really excellent. I encourage everybody to look at them. There's also a database of lectures going back for years of helping people with depression from all different aspects. There's a support line, there's a support mail service, there are support groups that at the moment are on Zoom and there are telephone, um, Zoom, uh, telephone support groups as well. So I really encourage people to look at them. And I'd also like to draw attention to our next webinar, which is going to be on the, just make sure I've got the date right, it's in March and it's on the 10th of March, Wednesday the 10th of March. And it's going to be, it's called Living Well with Bipolar Disorder. And that's great, the slide is up there. And that's going to be given by Dr. Declan Lyons, who's a great friend and ally for AWARE. And he's going to be accompanied by two people, Sinead Keating and Rick Rossiter. So that's going to be on the 10th of March at 12 noon. And that's part of AWARE's offerings to support World Bipolar Day on the 30th of March. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending this webinar. Those of you registered, you will be getting an email with a link to the recording, and it will also be on the webinar, uh, on, uh, on the website, apologies. So if you have any questions, if there's anything that you're left unsettled with, mm -hmm. please take that as a really good sign that there are some questions for you to discuss around the area of medication. And Eva, I'd like to finish by giving you an opportunity first to say if there's anything else you'd like to say and then, so I'll ask you that first and then I'll thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think I've probably said a lot. Um, what I would say is, you know, don't feel overwhelmed as, as you kind of said, Claire, in relation to, that was a lot of information and, and it takes a little bit of time to, to kind of grasp that. But what I also would say is if there's interest in it and AWARE would want me to, I'm happy to come back as many times as needed because I know it's, there's a lot and there's a lot of topics and, you know, any of the things we covered, you could probably talk about for 50 minutes in general. So if there's interest, I'm, I'm happy to come back as many times as needed. Thank you very much, Ita. And I know again from our conversations beforehand that some of the questions that people asked were so specific that it just was not possible or appropriate for you to answer. So my sense is there might be some people watching this feeling a little bit dissatisfied and I really would encourage them to, or maybe even a little bit confused, to take that as a good step that there's areas that they'd like more information on. So Gurmelia Mahogat, thank you so much. And thank you very much to everyone who has um, have joined us today. Thank you. Thank you.